So Das Black Milk, you guys have a new album out, uh, Bones in a Daydream. And I wanted to talk about um, the process. It sounds like it took a lot more time to write and arrange this than it did to record it. If I read correctly, you knocked this out in the studio in like two days. So like, how? just tell me a little bit about, you know, the, the preparation you did um, and what it entailed. And like, when you went in, like, was this thing pretty much ready to go? Yeah, I think... Um... We spent a lot of time like writing and arranging the songs and practicing them, uh, probably more so than we ever have with with any anything we've ever done. But really, by the time I, I think we went into the studio, it was just a matter of laying them down. We knew everything that we wanted to do. We were we felt super tight, super good about everything. So it was just a matter of getting the right person to capture like the energy. You know, because that's the thing, too, um, when it comes to making records. I don't know that we ever captured, like, our our energy or our live sound the appropriate way. So I think that was important to go in and try to bang it out as quick as, as possible. And, and we got, you know, Eric from Windmill, and he did a, a great job and was super accommodating and really understood what we were looking for, what we were trying to do, and help to sort of shape our vision and 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 get the final product down. Yeah, and I, I think we we took like like a year about like like we, we, from around the time we released our last EP, we just we just wrote and you know, we just played and rehearsed and wrote and like we weren't as concerned about shows or or and there was no conscious at the beginning. We we're just oh I got a new song, got a new song. We just keep rehearsing, rehearsing, writing, um, I guess and uh, tightening, uh, retightening, re rearranging mm -hmm. the songs talking <laughs> sharing our feelings about what we're doing with with everything and at first there was no conscious thought of like oh we're going to write this and it's going to be a record and we're going to do this and that we were just enjoying the 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 song craft part for a very long time and then uh eventually we're like wow we we put together what sounds to us something that could be arranged as an album and it's like well now how are we going to record this are we going to do it ourselves like we've always been are we going to you know level up a little or and try something different and yeah. uh we decided to you know enter the studio and then uh, how many, into that how point many songs were, oh, i wanted to ask how many songs were were in the mix like um did you have to whittle it down and, and kind of pick the the best of the bunch no you know what i i always like the idea of having more uh more songs than we need but in this case like we just kind of had 10 but what we did to nate's point was um like we rearranged and and kept working the songs like not to the point where they got flat or stale but it was a really great sort of process because there was like it was a thing where there was like no bad ideas you know what i mean so like anything anybody said like oh let's try this or let's try that like like we sort of left nothing on the table so this is really like the first batch of songs that i've ever done as a musician where I'm like, there's nothing else that I would want to do. Like anything, any other song, like you could pull it up and we could play it. I'd be like, oh man, I should have done this or should have done that. So like, I, I, at least for me, and I, I think it's the same for, you know, for Nate is just like everything we wanted to do, we just put it out there and it was really fulfilling that way. Yeah. And um, listening to it, it certainly doesn't sound like a tossed off thing you didn't, in a couple sessions. And I'm wondering, you know, there's there's also um, an approach where you could go in the studio and do like pre-production and, you know, bands with huge budgets will spend, I don't know, six months doing that. Does, did it yeah. kind of work out that the year you spent beforehand was, did that kind of end up being your pre-production in a way? I'd yeah, I so. think so. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, you, well, I, I'd say so, yeah. I mean, mm. I mean, there, I, there was, some seeds of talk of doing a couple of the songs in the studio first, you know, uh, at first. And, you know, so aside from, oh, well, which ones would we self-produce? And, you know, we were always bouncing our mixing ideas of, of what or what we'd like to have in the song or, oh, this song I'd like to have, you know, you guys singing a harmony in the back or, you know, things like of that sort, you know. So there were seeds of that before it eventually got to the point where we were going to, we're like, we know these songs. Let's let's do them live in the studio, and then add to that, you know. And as far as the how long it took, it, it, 
we just we uh we we went to work you know and uh i don't know and uh it i i didn't think we'd have it all done in a two-day session you know but we did i don't know yeah how did, how did you know you were done i always wonder how an artist knows like this is the finished product because you know um there, there is a, a monetary limitation to how long you can spend in the studio, but sometimes people record at home and they're like going on and on for years and years or something. How, how do you, how do you kind of come to an agreement? Like, okay, this song is finished. We literally just like played them all until it, there was nowhere, nowhere else to go. And I think that speaks to like your question in terms of the pre-production, like in terms of even like there was times where, I'm like, oh, let's like, let's work on, let's work on this harmony. You know what I'm saying? So like, we would stand there and like, just sing to each other, like lunatics in the practice room just to get it down. But at the same time, it's like the songs never, never got stale either. Right. They just sort of like kind of arrived and, and felt done. And then by the time we got to the studio, we were kind of walking in with a fully formed vision and like we even talked about like because I think we went in there with the idea that we wanted to do the thing where we use the studio right and we go like oh we're gonna take all the cool toys that Eric has and do all this like awesome stuff and then the songs like we kind of tracked everything and did it and did it and we're like there's nothing to add even at one point like he has this big awesome organ and I like I felt bad because I made him pull it out and I started playing with it and then like really nothing happened. I think it's on like 30 seconds of the song, but that was really the only thing. Like there was just sort of, I don't know. It just felt like, like it just felt good. I mean, not to kind of short shrift the answer, but like, it just felt really good. Yeah. Did you, um, I know you didn't have a lot of time as we're, we're kind of harping on here. Or I am at least, um, were there overdubs? Like how did you approach, you know, the actual tracking? I would say the majority of it is single tracked as far as like yeah. guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like I, I, you know, I, I use a, an amp splitter. So I'm using two amps in tandem with different effects. Maybe that equal two tracks, a couple like punch ins to fix some stuff during that, that we flubbed. And maybe Brian did a couple overdubs, but most of what was it you're hearing is us live. Like mm. there's, I, I'd say, very minimal guitar overdubs. Yeah. Now, is that yeah. kind of the way you generally operate or was that kind of a departure from? No, I'd say we're always layering and layering and layering. So this was like, yeah. I think our, our last EP was pretty live in this, in our home, in our, we did it in our yeah. practice live and again, and m more minimal than we used to do. So, but I yeah. think this really, really stripped down even yeah, though. It, yeah. We might have added some synth textures and samples that we brought with us, but guitar wise, uh -huh. what we're playing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like a lot of the, a lot of the synths and stuff. So like we use a drum machine. So all the sort of additional sounds that you hear, like are generated from our drum machine. So like the way that we worked, it was we set up live and basically played the tracks through to our drum machine track. So any synths and things like that that you hear are actually like already in the drum machine. So mm. if you were to like, for example, see us live, you'd get those same, those same sounds. So now, like, I think the cool thing with the album is like, when you see us live, like it almost sounds like the same, you know what right. I mean? So yeah, there's not, a, there's not a lot of variation. So that we could sort of like bring our, for lack of a better term, like band in a box anywhere and you get like you get the sound we want. There's not tons of variation. Yeah. Uh, Craig, I wanted to bring you on. Hello and welcome. And um, just wanted to ask a little about, you know, your impressions of, of kind of how this album went and what, what it was like to kind of, you know, knock this out in two days and add, add your parts to it. Yeah. Uh, and sorry for being a minute late. Um, I. I mean, I don't really have a lot more to say than what Nate and Brian did, but I think that, you know, like, like Nate said, we, we were just kind of working through songs and sort of by accident one day realized like, okay, yeah, this is enough. We can make an album. And, and we started to think like, yeah, it'd be cool. Why don't we do this in a studio? Maybe we could 
make a vinyl out of it. And I think that those constraints actually kind of helped to, mm -hmm. to put in, put an end date on it and to say like, we, we have to have something by then. And mm -hmm. yeah, it would be nice if we could just kind of get everything out all together and uh, all in one shot. And so we, <laughs> I think that's, that was what led us to kind of obsessively playing things over and over again, such that by the time we got in there, we really had a very good idea of what these songs meant for us and what they felt like. And, you know, when you play songs so many times, even just for yourselves, not even like out at a show for other people, some days were just kind of flat. Some days somebody's having a bad day. Some days were just like really on fire. You know, we, we had played them so much. We, it, it, we could really tell like what was good and what was bad. And, and I think having that already going into the studio, like we sort of knew what we were trying to capture was was like the the energy, which is, uh, you know, for the type of music that we write, where it's like there are a lot of synths. It's all the percussion is all drum machines like there is a there's a possibility that it could be very mechanical, um, mm -hmm. but that, you know, we we wanted to make sure that it felt very real and felt it felt live and really felt like, you know, we were putting ourselves out uh, like we were having a good night of practice. Um, and I think like, I mean, you guys tell me if you felt otherwise, but I feel like when we got there, it was just like, we obviously we, we had something, there was a little bit of pressure that we did something uh, right. Cause we, you know, we only had a couple of days to work with, but like, I felt like we were pretty, pretty loose and just kind of having fun. And I don't know if that comes across to other people, but, you know, I sort of feel it when I listen to it. Yeah, I feel like, you know, like years of, like Nate was saying, like bedroom recording and recording stuff by ourselves and just constant layering. At least for me, it was important to be like, you know, honestly, like, fuck that. Let's just play. Like, we're a band. We're a good band. We have fun. We play together. Let's just like, let's just put the pedal to the metal and like do it. And that was something that like was super important to me. And I think like, I don't know if we haven't even talked about it, but I think it was sort of just the vibe of the band of like, let's, let's just capture what we do in, in a, in a really good way. Uh, you guys um, talked about Eric Ritter, um, who has a studio windmill agency. I believe that is that in Mount Cobb. Is that where that's at? Or is yeah. That, yeah. So, I mean, um, a lot of people I've talked to have worked with him and it, it runs the gamut from like, kind of hard rock bands to Americana to, you know, Cabinet is recorded there, which is sounds nothing like you guys. So um, I, I'm wondering what you could tell me, like, what does he, what did he bring to the, to the party here? Cause you know, some producers are very much, you know, focused on the technical parts. Some are more like motivators or arrangers. Like what, what, how did he work with you guys? So like, one of the things you mentioned was Cabinet, which is interesting because like, like, Years ago, when we toured, the, the we actually used Cabinet's van, and Todd, yeah. who played fiddle for them. I don't know if he still does or not. Was our driver, oddly enough. Oh wow! So he he drove us right. But um, when we were looking for people to record with, like we came across him, and I looked him up and I saw that they had recorded with Cabinet, and I was like, you know, I want to record with somebody who isn't necessarily like in and I don't know if he is or not I never actually asked him but in my impression like wouldn't necessarily be into like drum machines mm -hmm. you know like I thought it was interesting that like he could record cabinet and then record us to bring a different lens to it because like just because we're a drum we use a drum machine doesn't mean like we're just a drum machine band you know what I mean mm -hmm. so I just felt like it would be interesting to get that that lens on it from that perspective. Yeah, I guess I'll uh, add that. No, oh, no, go ahead, Nate. Uh, uh, yeah, not too much, but just to, you know, he, the facility's great that he he runs and sound, room sounds great. Um, you know, and he's a great engineer. Pretty pretty loose. Uh, I mean, to what Brian said about him being open to our synthesized textures and drum machines and stuff you know he he was open to that just going with it with what we had in mind um and you know uh, he's a hands-on engineer and you know he's in control of the environment so 
for once we didn't have to be, you know, and yeah. we could just, you know, and get a, and, and capture and capture our performance, you know, which yeah. is, you know, when we're when we're turning the dials and we're wearing the instruments, very hard to do. And, yeah. you know, and it's also I think what he brought too was his mixes, you know, mm. which really, really brought some stuff out that I don't think we would have heard with our own ears being the songwriters. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, great. Uh, Craig, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't know. What you, no, I'll you know just add to that that like being in the studio, he he was he was just like uh, like Nate said, he had he had done a lot of work to make that space work really well, such that you know what the message that he was giving us was like, I'm gonna make it sound great. Don't worry about it. You guys just mm-hmm. do you do your thing. Be natural. Be fluid. And you know he didn't do too much of like hey why don't you try this or anything he was just like that sounds awesome you guys are doing great if we asked for suggestions or input like he, he had great ideas too but you know mostly he was just like supportive and was like yeah yeah this is awesome yeah keep doing it i love what you guys got um, yeah. he was great to work with and and yeah like like nate said the 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 mix is you know he did he put a little bit of his own flavor in it which was awesome i mean that was that was kind of what we wanted um, we yeah. wanted somebody who was going to add something to it um but yeah he he did it in a way that like certainly i i didn't feel like he he was like changing the the, the fabric or the nature of the songs you know right. just kind of enhancing a little bit right um i wanted to just go back to the beginning briefly and just uh for brian and nate really what were what kind of brought you together in the first place what were some of your common interests uh, at the time no and we, we 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 met at a job together oh, yeah many years ago and uh i don't know we uh i don't know i think i think I, I, actually I started talking but we just had a couple of mutual interests in a couple mutual bands that we liked yeah. traded music a lot became real close friends uh i was in another band that was kind of going out and he was demoing songs and we just started decided to start writing songs together and figuring out and figuring out with each step, you know, how to grow our, our vision from, from, uh, you know, soup to nuts, as they say, you know, from, from the bottom and it's, we're still figuring it out, <laughs> you know? <Right. laughs> well, what yeah. were some of those common bands that you liked? Well, uh, the, I, the, fir- you know what, the first, I think one of the first things we ever talked about was this band braid. Uh, and that was at our that was at that was at work and like not that we're huge braid fans but you don't meet a lot of braid fans sort of like yeah. walking around you know so yeah. then immediately we're like oh yeah have, have, yeah. <laughs> yeah right and so like immediately like we have stuff and you know we figure you know we figure we have stuff in common and then like then it went on to like i think our early our big early influence was the gun club um which like we still are heavily influenced by. And but I think the interesting thing though is like as much things, as many bands as we share interest in, like we still then and now bring different things to the table. So there's not a week or a month that goes by that I'm not like, oh Nate, did you hear about this band or whatever? And vice versa. So I think the thing that really like allowed us to start and continue on is like the diverse nature of the things that we listen to so mm-hmm. one one of the first sort of like i guess mission statements or quote-unquote rules that we had are like we're gonna just do like whatever we want like we don't want to be held down by anything and then we quickly kind of got away from that because then we started getting drummers and bass players like which was great you know what i mean but that wasn't really ever the vision the vision always was like just sort of like the two of us doing weird shit <laughs> like either drum machines or whatever and then yeah as it expands you know you start to do stuff and i'm super happy and grateful for all that time that we did that other stuff but i think now is like in some ways this feels like like our first album in some strange mm-hmm. way and now with craig on board like that him like the additional thing that he adds to it it's sort of indescribable he sort of like helps to bring all the different things that Nana bring to the table together in a way with 
I mean, with his bass, you know what I mean? And, and his harmonies and different things. So it's really like, it's just sort of, uh, it's everything. And I think, especially for this album, I think the main thing is like, I feel like in some ways, like life wrote this album. I know that's like a cheesy kind of cliche thing, but like, you know, things have been crazy in the world and COVID and this, that, and the other thing. And now like, we're kind of all getting older. And like, now I, I just don't, I think like, we just sort of know who we are and it mm -hmm. becomes easier to have art express that. When you guys were starting out and uh, then it became time to, you know, stick your head out in the world a little and, and do gigs and stuff. What, what was it like then? Like where I know Scranton has, kind of a history of this like underground music scene venues have come and gone but like there's been this core group of people there's been labels coming and going and stuff what what was there like what was kind of the infrastructure you know as you remember it nate that's you i have a terrible memory <clears throat> um i mean scranton you know i mean again the you know the the center of a lot of music throughout the years and still a little bit now is the bog you know right play there you, you're aware of the of the establishment you know um you know so there was a scene that was maybe more older uh you know over 21 audiences so a lot of bars you know um not as much you know diy shows uh, per se at, at small spaces or, or like pop-up spaces independent spaces you know there was a little basement space called test pattern that was like right. across from the bog and mm -hmm. that's where like some all ages shows happen well, those venues yeah and a lot of bars in the scranton area uh wilkesbury the neighboring town had a, a little more of a thriving all ages show you know with cafe metropolis and you know, with shows like that and the venue yeah. that do. um so you know but that's kind of those are kind of like the places we've played you know, around that formative time. Yeah. I'd say. Unless I'm forgetting yeah. something. And if I am, I. Yeah. I, and then, you know, obviously these shows. Are, anybody or anything out, you know. Yeah. And obviously, you know, the shows are usually there's multiple acts, you know, where there's some that you tended to like kind of join forces with and do a lot of shows with and become, you know, yeah. peers or friends with comrades in some way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just yeah, trying for to sure. make the, the, the common venues, but, you know, you know, venues come and go and, you know, sometimes you know a lot of a lot of oh there's the keys we played at the keys and yeah. Scranton a whole lot they they were jen at the keys was super supportive of us and we did the majority of our shows there over the past or over the like the pre-pandemic block of years you know mm -hmm. and that was a big show space uh for a lot of bands i'd say locally in scranton so i can't i i can't believe i almost left them out you know but um yeah. but like Venues come and go, you know, uh, that's just the, the natural order of things. And, you know, uh, so, you know, sometimes we'd play a place once and we never do another show there, you know, or, or something. Yeah. Or, you, know, you know, it's. Yeah. It's I, you know, you, oh, go ahead, Brian. I, I was going to say, I'll, I'll tell you some bands, but the one guy that I do want to shout out because he was literally like a supporter right, and a patron in some respects of ours in the very beginning. And that's Bob Mack, who runs. He now runs uh, the Utopia Smoke Shop in downtown Wilkes-Barre, but he has a show space in the basement called Spaceman Arts. And he actually booked our very first show ever. Wow. And we played two we played two nights at Test Pattern. And still, every time he starts a new party or a new space, he always invites us and has and treats us like so wonderfully. So we're so grateful for his support over the years. And it's just really cool that like all this time has passed and we still work together and we still support each other. And then in terms of bands, I think I'd be remiss to not mention one of our favorite local bands, Kid Icarus. Yeah. I was just about and, to say, uh, Eric yeah. Slither, Kid Icarus and his label Summer Step Records were yeah. Well, yeah. as close to poor as when we're getting into names of people. Go ahead, Brian. Right. Yeah. I was just seconding that. Yeah. So yeah, I just want to shout out Bob and yeah, Kid Kid Icarus. And then the other guy that's always been with us. And he's like, he's he'll yell at me if I say this, but I'll say it anyway. He's sort of the unofficial fourth member of Das Black Milk, and that's Chuck Keller. And he runs the Stress Carrier record yeah. label. Him and I run that label. 
And that's kind of where we document you know, everything, everything we do. And he's just super talented. And he had the green chair of that band. Yeah. Um, who we love. And then he, he uh, had another band that I played in called full Marine petrols and he's still doing solo stuff. Now that's absolutely incredible. So I think in terms of bands, I'm, I'm missing some, I'm missing a ton, I'm sure, but they're really, you know, good friends of ours, even still to this day. Yeah. One thing I noticed about um, the Scranton area, um, I haven't lived in a lot of small towns, so I don't know if this is common, but, you know, people make the most, like, like-minded people, instead of saying there's nowhere good to play, there's no, they, oh, there's not a label? Okay, let's let's make a label. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's not a great uh, space. Uh, well, well, okay, this place is imperfect, let's do it. Like, the bog is, in some ways, like, I love it, but it's like the worst possible place to see music in a way because you're crammed in there and there's a stage <laughs> yeah, and you is. have that big post. But uh-huh. in some ways it makes it better. And to think like who's played there over the years and like some of the cool acts I've seen over the years and they, okay, well, you know, Bill will come in and make it sound good or, you know, it, it's yeah. like, it, it always seems to be like this thing where, and I, I think the listeners appreciate it more too, because like I live in New York now and it's like, you pick the things like not to do like right now there's probably mm-hmm. five of my favorite bands playing right now and i'm like ah it's fine they'll play here in a few months but like right. i remember like if somebody cool was coming to the bog like i'd i'd be looking forward to it for like a month you know so yeah. do, do you have you guys i'm sure it's a struggle sometimes but over the years have you noticed there's kind of like that a little bit of that excitement like oh these guys are putting something out i can't even listen to it. it's like not not a common occurrence that something that you're really into is going to be coming out or, or available to go see live or experience with your buddies or whatever. Yeah. I think, I think it's peaks and valleys, you know? Right. Yeah. So like when we yeah. first started the band and maybe it's because we were young or whatever, but there was so many bands and it was like super exciting and all this stuff. And then over the years, like a lot of bands come and go, except for us, we're still here doing it for some reason, right. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, so like throughout the years, like whatever, whatever, and bands come and go. And sometimes it's really exciting. Other times, like there's nothing going on. And then coming out of the, like going into the pandemic, going out of it, there was like no places to play anymore. It was just, everything seemed very bleak. And then all of a sudden, like, I don't know, you know, a year and a half ago going into now, there's tons of bands, people are doing shows all over like it's really exciting again and it's really interesting because now like there's all these like young kids starting bands and they're all really good right Mm -hmm. and they're all really exciting they're all doing house shows again and um you know there's different places and it's just really like in a really exciting time to sort of be involved with the scene um like i said i got bleak for a while not that there's not good bands out there and stuff but um it's it's just it's really exciting now and like it makes me proud to see all these bands from wilkes Bear and Scranton doing stuff and the thing is too which is even most interesting is like all the kids now in the scene are so nice they're the nicest kids i've ever i've ever met it's like it makes Frank me can't feel stop like... going on about this it's true they're so <laughs> every nice. time i see him he's like i can't believe these young people are so nice they're so they different are. than we were they are yeah i remember were... like i yeah, remember like they don't have that like, Gen X darkness in them. Yeah. That like years ago, like we, we'd have like, I don't know, some touring band would come in and they'd be on whatever label and we'd be all excited and they'd get to the show and like wouldn't look, they literally wouldn't talk to us. So like, I think we adopted that because I don't know, that's what you're supposed to do or something, right. I guess, because we didn't know what the hell we were doing, you know? Right. Like, I, I guess that's what cool kids from the city or something do. And yeah. like we're not like that at all. So it was sort of out of our out of our nature. But now it's just like you go and everybody's like real happy and you're like, oh, this is like wonderful. Like I feel so welcomed. Yeah, I feel oh. there's a real I feel there's a real around here now with the younger bands. I feel like there is a serious real desire to, you know, perpetuate like community, you know, between artists. And maybe it has something to do with the way, you know, like streaming's not paying so right. I, I believe i feel there's a common thread with younger younger people where you know where they really want to support each other and you know that rising tide raises all ships mentality yeah. is, is really truly there in a sincere way that i don't think i've 
and this is personal. I can't talk about other people or how they feel. It might, you know, personal age bracket or whatever. But I feel I feel it's 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 very a lot more sincere, and, mm -hmm. and you know it's 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 energizing. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, how do you go about you know, you know when you you guys disappear for a while and you put something out? There's just going to be a built-in core of people that have been with you from the beginning or for 10 years or five years or four years or, or whatever. And whether it's people you personally know, or that came to a few shows, but like, or maybe know the label, some people follow labels, you know, and they like, they, they give everything on that label a chance, but how do you go about, um, and it's, this is hard for people to do, but I think, how do you go about like reaching brand new people that never heard of you that, you know, never saw you play, don't know anything about what you've done? Like, is it just a matter of promoting the heck out of your shows or like, you know, I know there's obviously social media, but I mean, if you're not paying a lot of money, I don't know where that's going to take you. Well, the first thing, one of the first things that I, I made a list when we were putting the album together of things we wanted to do to reach out to people. And the first thing that I said is, let's let's call you huh. and see if you would. Well, if you that's, see the top, if you that's would. the top of your list. And I got, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> no, seriously, though, because like, I don't know, you know, it's so different now and it's so hard because there's so many there's so many avenues and so many things and like every way that I guess you're supposed to reach new people seems like a weird pyramid Ponzi scheme online where you're supposed yeah. to give people money for stuff. Like, so I, I think to, to Nate's point is I think the only way is to get out and, and play shows. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I still, I still believe in, and guys like you who cover music, right? Like real, real journalists who are arbiters of things. But I, I also realize that much like us, like they're a dying breed at this point. And it's, it makes me super sad. And I think at some point, maybe it'll come back. But at the same point, like there is hope because now it's just back to sort of hitting the streets with your stuff and playing yeah. shows and getting, getting in front of people. Yeah. Nate, I want to ask, you know, you said uh, the, the, the phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I was wondering um, if over the years, bands like, you know, Cabinet was pretty big and then still, you know, could probably do big tours if they so desire. And then you, you mentioned uh, you guys were talking about Cafe Metropolis and some of the best banners, some of the bands that came through there, Tiger's Jaw, Title Fight, Menzingers, some of them still in the area, some of them not. But to see them get like recognition beyond, you know, just the bubble of the Scranton Wilkes area, does that does that change anything? Does that offer any sort of encouragement? Even if it's like it's like, hey, it could be done here. Like people could, you know, like does it knock away some sort of maybe I always felt there's a little bit of an infer inferiority complex in the area. Like I just felt that. Or maybe it was just me. Maybe I just had one. But I felt like it would always be like, those guys are good for being from Scranton or like they're pretty that guy's a good guitar player or a good drummer for a guy from yeah. you know Clark yeah. Summit or something and it's like can we just cut that last part off and just say this yeah. is a good band and like I was I just to ramble for a second but I learned it when I moved to New York and some guy was telling me you know I'm really into the into the Scranton bands and this guy was from New Jersey so what do you mean the Scranton bands who do you mean and he goes oh I really like and he, he meant Scranton and Wilkes-Barre you know and he's like he never heard it like Wilkes-Barre but he knew like, oh, I know who Title Fight is. He's like, you know those guys? Like, you know, you know, so, you know the guys, you know, Brian from Tigers? Yeah, I'm like, well, yeah. He's like, oh, my God. I was like, it turned my perspective around because it's easy to, like, think, oh, these guys are good for here. But, like, I don't know. Does, like, some of that success outside of the area change attitude at all or anything? Or I, I really couldn't say, to be honest. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I feel that if it's almost like, there's always going to, yeah, the inferiority complex thing, uh, I guess. I mean, you know, because we're sandwiched in between NYC and Philly, you know, and but I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like if you know, you know, and those people who yeah. appreciate those acts that really blew up from this area, yeah, you know, I don't think they put that addendum at the end of the sentence too much. If, if for my opinion or my my um yeah i don't think it happens anymore as much you know and i and maybe some of the younger people don't you talk about the positivity i know like i'm probably roughly around the same age as you and i'm like i know there's like a little bit of a i don't know 
like the, I don't know if it's the the coal miner thing or the or the <laughs> vendors or something, but there there could be a little bit of a, like a a downer mentality sometimes, you know. It's yeah. like, and it's easy to like, oh, here we go, another venue closed, you know, or just yeah. when things are getting good, you know, don't don't get used to it because it's gonna get taken away from you or something like that. Um, that's pretty. That's pretty. Yeah. That's my that's my mantra for the most yeah. part. That's gonna that's gonna be on my headstone like when I when I pass away. <laughs> Um, my advice, my advice, my advice is: don't get too excited and don't get too disappointed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we go, I definitely want to touch on the live shows. And um, can you just tell me a little bit about, like, uh, kind of what you have planned, whether it's specifically or just like a general approach to what you hope to to do in the in the coming months or whatever? Well, I, we're working on booking as many shows as we can probably locally for now. And uh, just going to try to grind away and get out there and get our record out of the city limits, I guess, you know, um, that's the plan that we're working on now, you know, so play out as much as possible. Where, like, where are the paces to play now? We talked about the places that used to be the, the places, you know, what are some of the, options for guys like you now well brian said our friend bobby bob mack runs a uh, diy space called spacement wilkesbury uh it's it's pretty awesome um not just music he does all kinds of comedy shows film festivals uh appealing to pretty much all all demographics which is really cool and uh um i i think that's the main place i would plug right now you know, well, like locally, locally. Yeah. I mean, you know, but again, like I said, I, I'm just right now what's popping up now is a lot of house shows and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's really even more DIY than that, you know, but we really love playing at Spacement and we love uh, connecting with uh, a lot of the people who frequent DIY shows like that because it's just, I don't know, the energy is there, you know? Yeah. Uh, Brian, I did want to ask about Stress Carrier and, um, you know, what, What's kind of like the philosophy of, of the label, you know, uh, what, what are you hoping to put out in the world? So it's really, it's really just a documentation, uh, of sort of experimental outsider music from Northeast Pennsylvania. It started, um, where we had, you know, more contributors and things like that. And, you know, everybody kind of, I don't want to say fell away, but fell away. So essentially now it's, we release Das Black Milk stuff, anything that I do solo under whatever moniker uh, that I'm currently deciding to use when I'm not working with Das Black Milk. So a lot of that stuff is just, you know, maybe drone stuff or I guess I maybe call it electronic, whatever. And it's uh, a lot of the stuff that, that Chuck, that Chuck does. And then also, the other sort of main band on that is my other project called steak eggs, um, which is like, uh, I'm not really sure <laughs> what you want to call it. It's an experimental thing. I don't know. It's, it's a sort of a, a genre list thing. Um, yeah, every steak so, egg is, is different than the last. Yeah. All it's a different concept. So, Yeah. It's a lot of, yeah, a lot of the snake egg stuff is like Chuck and I, like, we'll get, like Nate was saying, like, we'll literally decide on like a concept and just run with it. Not that they're conceptual albums per se, but it's just however, however the, however the phrase or the idea kind of hits us. So uh, with stress care, yeah, we'll do, you know, Das Black Milk, anything Chuck's up to, snake eggs. And then in the future, uh, you know, we're hoping to release more bands. So if there's any bands out there that, are interested in, in doing something with us, you know, we'd be, we'd be happy to, to talk to you as long as, as long as you're trying something, man, like I'll, I'll support, you know, I'll do, I'll do whatever, whatever we can to help you. Yeah. And I don't know if people, you know, people that are going to watch this are aware of some of the, you know, label history of, of the Scranton area, you know, and I just, I think back to prison jazz was mm -hmm. okay. Patty and the swims and, uh, with the A sides, and I think there was a bank. Uh, there's a bank called New Motels. Like there was some great stuff coming out, and Prairie Queen. 
is putting out yeah. some really cool stuff. Um, Pappy from Cabinet put out an album on that label that I love. Mike Quinn, who's mm -hmm. going to be open for Dr. Doc pretty soon with the man with the, with the teeth, which is pretty neat. But like, oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, there's there's like, you know, I don't know, there could be a documentary, like a good documentary of, if you just focused on the record labels, you know. Um, anything else you guys wanted to add? I didn't want to keep it too long. Um, I think we covered a lot about the album and the process of making it. Anything else you wanted to mention? No, I mean, um, thank you so much for continuing to do what you do. Like I said, um, I, I believe that the kind of journalism you do and covering bands and the music is so very important. Um, and thanks for that. You know what I mean? Uh, really, it's it's super appreciated and, and it doesn't, doesn't go unnoticed at all. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I do it for the fun of it. And if a couple of people see it and get something out of it, it's great. And to expose people to different stuff. And one, one thing I wanted to say to, to, to maybe some people that aren't familiar with you, if they happen to click on this, um, is you guys might not agree with this at all, but the this record in particular makes me think of bands coming out of Canada. Like um, it makes me think a little bit of like Wolf Parade and uh, some of the projects Dan Beckner did. I don't even know if any of you guys are into any of that stuff, but usually when I tell bands something reminds me of something, I and like, I say, I'm not really into that, which I think is kind of cool too. But that's like, good. I've listened to Bachner's new album, Dan yeah. Beckner, Bachner, and, and uh, yeah, his new album's been. It's really good. It. So I'm, yeah, I'm familiar with Wolf Parade and stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't think they were a conscious influence at all, but uh, I'm familiar with it. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bands I like of all over Canada. There's a lot. I, I dig Mets. They're pretty great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm but, sure there's a lot of bands you guys I, are into. I, that. Like, I, I like, heard I like to hear comparisons to. because I, I yeah. just wonder what people think, you know? So it's. Yeah. Um, but, I think the reason I. I gravitated to that because I've listened to them a lot. So like there's probably someone awesome. else will hear something else because they just listen to, you know, some other band's catalog. So I think that's cool that you could kind of put your own, have your own perspective on it. Um, all right. Hey, guys. Scran Scran Scran's the new Canada. It is. Well, maybe someone else. Like, you know, this reminds <laughs> me of the Scranton bands. This, this whole arcade fire thing is, you know, might catch on. You know? That's good. I hope so. Canada. Brian Adams too, uh, Justin Bieber, Nickelback. There's a lot. You know, uh, and Brian, Brian Adams cuts like a knife. That song, yeah. I love that song. Since it's I was great, a the old yeah. Brian Adams stuff is really good. It when, is. It comes, when it comes on the supermarket, I I go off to that song. Yeah, <laughs> and it's one of Brian Langan's favorite artists too. Big time. That, yeah. he, he's got great taste. <laughs> he does. He does. All right, guys, I really appreciate it. And uh, Das Black Milk, uh, Bones in a Daydream, you could find it on Bandcamp. You could find it wherever you can listen to music. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. See you. Bye-bye.